Morning everybody. Welcome to the Your Body, Your Consent workshop. Um, this is something that the Royal College of Pathologists organised, so just a quick bit about the college. We are one of the Royal Colleges of Medicine, so there's surgeons, there's physicians, and we're the pathologists. And we are responsible as a college um, for organising and supervising the training of pathologists and providing sort of ongoing training throughout. There's lots of us, about 11,000, and we work around hospitals. And if you wanted to find out more about pathology, those are the places to go. There is a thing called National Pathology Week, which takes place in November. So to get you all engaged, you've got a green card and a yellow, a red card. Stand up, or you can, I'm not gonna make you stand up. Shall I make them stand up? Yes, yeah, stand up with your cards, and I will ask you some questions. And when you get the wrong answer, sit down again. So, this is a practice question. If you think that the correct answer is pathology is a popular subject, hold your green card up. If you think nobody would ever watch a television program around pathologists, hold your red card up. And I will tell you the answer, which in this case obviously is green, okay? Do you have to be a doctor to work in pathology? I'm a doctor. I'm medically qualified. No, you don't. In fact, Roxy, one of the facilitators in the back, uh, worked within our pathology department um, and doesn't have a medical degree. How many pathology specialities are there? Sorry, you have to sit down. Anybody else holding a green card up has to sit down. Okay. Is one of those specialities surgery? No, it isn't. Surgeons are an entirely different group of people. Oh, excellent stuff. Which do you think is the biggest one? Hematology or histopathology? Depends how you measure biggest, of course. Let's go for employs the largest number of staff. That would be histopathology. And chemical pathology, study of the chemicals in the blood and urine and other things. <laughs> uh, okay. And what percentage of us actually do forensics generally? Not very many. Oh, we're getting there. Postmortem is also known as a local. <laughs> okay, that was an easy one. And who actually carries them out? Okay. And HTA stands for? Yeah, I wouldn't be giving a lecture on heavier than air, would I? And a donation from one dead person. How many people can that help? You're quite right. And what age do you have to be before we stop collecting your tendons and your heart valves? 60. This is taking a long time. You're better than usual. Normally we don't get to these last few questions. Is it a criminal offence to keep human tissue without the consent? Yes, it is. Uh, and we'll talk about that in some detail. And how long do I go to prison for if I do it? Thankfully, only three. So, the stuff proper that you're here to see. I have some very simple rules of questions, which Catherine, who starts as a medical student, will get to know. There is no such thing as a stupid question. Everybody in the room is in the same situation as you. If you don't know the answer, nor do they, ask because my job is to make sure you leave here understanding and if you don't understand it's because I haven't explained it properly it's not because you're not clever enough and likewise the purpose of asking a question is to find out if I've taught you or if I've educated helped you understand properly so your inability to ask the to answer a question is my fault don't let the school teachers know that's the rules of questions because they think they always know the right answer <laughs> okay so what we're actually interested in is your views on ethics. Um, issues like consent, organ donation, 
um, the, the medical research and things. And actually, we're going to break you up into small groups so that you can actually um, talk about it amongst yourselves because you will have widely differing opinions. But quick stuff about the background. Classic picture of a hospital. Classic pictures of pathologists. Anybody recognize this guy? Oh, dear me. That's Ducky Mallard, who's on NCIS, should you happen to watch it. It's available on all over the television. He's the closest example of a proper histopathologist um, that I've come across. He treats people with respect. Do we recognize this lot? They're all from Silent Witness. As pathologists, they're kind of averagely bad, but they spend most of their time doing things which would get them struck off if they tried, because they go out to the crime scene on their own and all sorts of stupid things. That's the image most people have. I was speaking at the Noirwich Festival on Friday and speaking to the authors saying, that's actually really quite offensive to pathologists and more frightening. Um, 10% of you, 15% of you in your lives will have somebody you're close to who has to have a post-mortem. And if you get the image of a nice chap in a bow tie being very caring when he does the post-mortem, it's very much better than somebody like that who just looks ghoulish and horrible. Um, and I find that upsetting largely because it's the completely the wrong image. I actually work in a mortuary like this. This isn't ours. This is one of the mortuaries in London. Um, but you can tell by the fact that the floor is shining. You could probably eat your dinner off the floor once they've finished cleaning it. We wash down carefully all the time. And pathology is one of the very big clinical disciplines within a hospital. We tend to subdivide it into four disciplines in every hospital. So um, you have the chemical pathologists. They're actually dealing with blood and urine. Have you had a blood test recently? I mean, apart from me. What did you have done? I don't want... I'm having an operation. I've got a blood clotting disorder, so we can check out. Okay. Blood clotting doesn't go to chemical pathology, but the clotting factors that help your blood clot are made in your liver. So we always look at the function of the liver from somebody who's having an operation because we want to make sure they don't bleed too much on the table because that tends to embarrass the surgeon when the blood's flowing under the door. Everybody wonders what he's up to. Um, blood clotting disorders are dealt with by the haematologists because clotting is a function of the cellular constituents as much as the chemical constituents in the blood. Histopathology, these are just cartoons off the internet. And then of course there's microbiology. I love this one. If you go to the States, you genuinely can buy a stuff for you to eat called Mrs. Thrall's Pus Packets. They're fish with a cheese sauce in the middle. I can't conceive of why anybody would want to eat them, but there we are. And you're all too young to remember, but uh, I started work in uh, the Paget in 1992. And at that time, we were working under the 1961 Human Tissue Act, which assumed that you'd given us consent to do anything we wanted to, your de to dead bodies. We just took it as red. You wouldn't mind us doing anything. We were, and we pretty much did it. And then it was revisited in 2004. And the reason that happened was because in the child paediatric cardiac surgery unit in Bristol, somebody noticed they had more deaths than usual. So they were investigating that unit and they wanted to find out what had happened. And they discovered that the surgeons sent the hearts of the babies they'd operated on to Alder Hay Hospital in Liverpool, where the pathologist put them on a shelf to get round to looking at them later. So lots of those babies who died were buried and their heart was sitting on a shelf somewhere in Liverpool. And out of that, they discovered that tissue was being stored everywhere. Um, pathologists had hordes of tissue and there were millions of pieces of tissue that had just been kept because the pathologist thought it might be interesting for no better reason than that. Um, and um, there were a few legal cases where everybody said the 1961 Human Tissue Act makes this legal and every hospital had to appoint a pathologist to speak to members of the public who were concerned. Thankfully when I was at the Paget we'd been very efficient because we'd had a problem a couple of years earlier and we'd cleared out our store so we had 
no stored tissue that the person didn't know about. But we did have some material which we'd collected at autopsy, and I had to go out and talk to people whose you know, material we'd got in our store from an autopsy. And it was fairly distressing for me, um, but surprisingly alleviated a lot of distress of people because they suddenly had somebody who would explain what had gone on in the first place. Um, but the result of all that was the House of Commons passed a very, very carefully written law uh, which laid down the rules. So they defined what human tissue is. It's material other than gametes which consists of or includes human cells. So it is your urine, your faeces, your spit. Hair from the dead but not from the living. Sorry guys, your hair isn't human tissue until the minute you're dead and it is. Anybody got any idea why? Pick on one of the few blokes in the room. When did you last have your hair cut? Uh, I don't know. Because if we made hair from the living human tissue, every single barber would have to dispose of all that hair he cut off in the same way as I have to dispose of pieces removed at operations, bodies in our mortuary, because it would be counted as human tissue. He can't have bits of it left lying around. He has to have your consent for every single hair that he leaves on the floor. So it was just too impractical for words. So we said, OK, we won't call hair, fingernails and things, human tissue, because it would just make the act unbelievably difficult because it made consent for the handling of the tissue an absolute central part. It has to be fully informed consent, which means the people have to understand what it is that we're planning to do with the tissue in a reasonable way that they're capable of it. So that means research. It means audit, which is where we check that we're doing our job properly. It means teaching medical students, trainee doctors. If I was to bring some human tissue here, I would have to get consent to do that with it. So we have to be very, very careful about getting consent. And we have to work out who it is. So who gives that consent? So one of the things you might discuss is actually who should give consent? Because clearly if somebody's dead, short of going to the spiritualist church for some help, you can't get their consent for anything at all. And this is really an interesting aspect of ethics, but ethics is one of those things that doctors find interesting. So I was just going to trip through uh, an ethics question just to get you engaged with how we do it. And this is really a question about what is morally right, and what is morally right may differ for each of us. We may all have a different opinion, and a lot of those problems come from genetic testing. So. Jane, this is actually a true case. Um, I met Jane. Uh, she was a nice girl. Um, 17, so your age. Pregnant, but her and John had been together for 12, since they were about 12. And she'd got some particularly benign parents. I'm not sure that if my daughter had come home from East Norfolk Sixth Form College at the age of 16 and said, 17, and said, hi, Dad, I'm pregnant, I'd have been quite that forgiving but then I'm probably not a good parent. Um, but they are quite happy to look after the child while she goes to university. She knows the family, um, but she never met his grandparents. And once they'd sort of got over the shock, they decided to get the two families together. And that's what happened to Jane's mum. This isn't Jane's mum. This is actually a random picture off the internet. Um, but clearly, shocking black eye been thoroughly beaten up. And that was John's granddad, who openly said, yeah, I did it, but I've got this thing, it's called hunting, Huntington's disease, which makes me behave like that. I beat people up because I've, and it's uh, sometimes called Huntington's dementia. It's a form of dementia where people tend to get violent. And it's genetic. It's autosomal dominant. Anybody, everybody know what autosomal dominant means? Okay, it means if you inherit one copy of the abnormal gene, you're gonna get Huntington's. 
you will start going demented at the age of 45, which means you've already probably had your children and passed it on before you're known. Who watches the medical documentary otherwise known as Casualty? Good, you remember there's, there's one doctor who survived and his brother was knifed and their mother had hun has Huntington's. So the one who was knifed didn't inherit it, that was the one who was knifed and the one who survived does have it and knows he's got it. Do you remember the storyline? Yeah. Excellent. Can you imagine? Well, they did it actually fairly well, the sort of emotional trauma of understanding. And what had happened in John's family is they all knew the implications, but they said, actually, we just don't want to know. We don't think it will make our lives any better and it will probably make them much worse if we know that in a few years' time we're going to go bonkers and start beating our friends up. And so they chose not to be tested. We can test with the gene now. So, that's Grandad, just there. That's John's mum, who's married to John's dad, and there's no reason to believe he carries the gene. John is one of five children, and he has an identical twin brother. And that's the baby. So, John's mum, 50-50 chance of catching it. John, one in four, baby one in eight. And we can test for this gene, should we test. And if you start thinking about it, who are we going to test? Are we going to test John's mother? Who thinks we should test John's mother? That's good. Who thinks we should test John? John has already chosen not to know. Who thinks we should test the baby? Because of course testing the baby carries a 10% chance of having a dead baby at the end of it because the process of testing, I love the look on your face, it's a pretty terrifying thought, isn't it? We have to advise people on this kind of thing all the time. The effect on John, if we test the baby and he's positive, John knows he's positive, so he's got to live with his knowledge that he's positive. He knows his brother's positive because they're identical twins, which means if his does, brother doesn't want to know, he's got to choose whether he tells him or keeps it a secret. And of course, he knows his mum's positive, and his mum would at this time have been getting up towards the age where she's starting to go off. And those of us who are beyond a certain age will recognise that occasionally the memory slips just a bit. And with me, I just know I can't remember my kids' names, it's normal. Um, but if I had Huntington's in the family, they'd be going, is he going to beat them up? Should we ever let him look after the grandchildren again? And can you think of how much that suspicion would destroy a family? What would Jane do? Would you, a horrible question. What would you do if you were Jane? Anybody, I mean, clearly guys, you're not allowed to answer this question. What would you do if you were Jane? This bloke has got you pregnant and didn't tell you that there was this significant risk that your child was going to be of an age in 45 years time when you're only going to be 63, 64, this child could be beating you up. And he didn't tell you. How long would, okay, how long would he remain your boyfriend if he'd done that to you? Probably won't. Yeah, I suspect if he was my daughter's boyfriend, I think, well, yeah, pathologists, we know how to conceal the evidence. So I'd be so cross. So you can see the massive complications that come out from these very complex ethical decisions. It goes further, in fact. Let's see, Matt, I'm going to appoint you. You're now a life insurance broker. How much life insurance are you going to give somebody who says, oh, I've got Huntington's disease? None. Which means, OK, you can't have life insurance, which means you can't have a mortgage. You can't take a significant loan. So it means you can't own your own house, you can't own your own car. Ooh, horrible mess. So knowledge of, a genetic, of genetic information may be massively problematic. In fact, so much so that the insurance, you know, all the insurance companies have got together to, because the right to borrow money is so important in modern society that they've agreed that they will never take account of genetic testing as part of your insurance risk unless it's for Huntington's disease. It's the only disease where they can take it into account on the grounds that if your parents or grandparents have got Huntington's, they just assume you've got it and hammer you. So you can go along and wave a negative test and say, no, I'm all right. And then you get normal insurance rates. Everything else, 
because we can't test for the genes particularly effectively, they won't take it into account. Okay. And then, of course, there's the broader aspects. And medicine is moving incredibly quickly, really, really quickly. And we throw away tissue left, right, and centre. So, the N&N &N department, that's just one hospital in Norwich, so it doesn't include the Paget and it doesn't include Kings Lynn. They get 16,000 blood samples a day, which amounts to 100 litres. My car holds 25 litres that's of petrol, that's four cars worth. And we throw away 90 litres of it because we always take too much because you can't get just the right amount. So, all those blood tests you had, most of the blood has now flowed away down the drain because that's how it's disposed of, or been incinerated because that's how it's disposed of. And we could use that for research. So the question is, should we be allowed to? If I wanted to do some research on blood changes in somebody who's had an operation, I could collect some from your teacher before the operation and after the operation, remove anything that identifies it as her and study the effects of operations on blood. She'd never know. Would it matter? Would it matter? Would you care? That absolutely sums up what came out of the Bristol Heart stuff. Almost every parent said, if they'd asked us, we wouldn't have minded. It was the fact they didn't ask. So you basically said why we needed the 2004 Human Tissue Act. And Roxy, who's one of the facilitators, actually works for me in the NNN, setting up a system for getting consent to use leftover blood for research. But we will only do it if people give consent. Roxy has a frightening success rate, so I think when I send her off to get consent, there have been occasions when she said, I'm not happy to take consent off this person. Everybody else where she's happy to take it has said, yeah, that's fine. Um, so people are always very willing, and our biggest problem is they didn't speak English adequately. They weren't um, cognitively quite up to it, because they were beginning to show the early signs of dementia. Sometimes it's just not the right time. I mean, you know, 20 minutes before your operation, this is the last thing you think of. Um, and so proper consent is very important. I, I once gave tissue for, an for research after an operation, um, and they asked me for consent. Uh, I, get, I said yes in between saying one and two. No, you can't. Yeah, I had to count to ten while I was having the anaesthetic, and I said, one, yeah, that's fine, two, three, four. And that's not proper consent, because, you know, I was zonked. So, there are all these issues. So what we're actually going to do now is break up into our groups. We've got the facilitators, um, and they will uh, consider these sorts of questions. So, you'll have two questions to look at. You'll get a question on the front of the card, um, and a bit of a background and some ideas of what other people have said. We've, uh, it's a bit like pointless. We've sent people out from the college to talk to members of the community and these are their comments. And we really just want you to feed back, remembering there is no right and wrong answer. I, my opinion is no better than yours. Um, everybody in the room, his opinion is equally correct. But what we don't want is anybody to start talking down to other people and say, oh, no, I know better than you. You don't. We're all the same. So listen to what everybody else says and kind of have a discussion to expand your views. And then we'll feed back at the end to see whether the groups have come up, you know, see what collectively people have decided. Anybody got any questions before you break up into groups? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, have any of you signed up for organ donation? Yeah, good. Um, have you talked to your families about it? So, would it surprise you to know that a very high proportion of uh, donations don't go ahead because the family says no? I'd hope, same with me, I'd hope that they'd take my consent over if they had, like the nurse explained to my family, well, she signed this, she wanted this, then I'd like to hope and think, oh, well, that's something she wanted to do, so. And you'd hope that your own consent would matter more than theirs, mm. because that's mm. something you believed in, not yeah. them. What about, you said about um, people being dead and, uh, and donating their tissue, what about live tissue? So what about if you had a, an operation, for example, and they removed a part of your body, 
they tested it and they used a small bit to diagnose what was wrong with you. What about the rest of it? Would you be happy for them to, to use the rest of it? Yeah, I don't think any harm was done. And if they're going to use it for a good cause, then it's far enough to keep it because it's got no other purpose really. So rather than wasting it and throw it away, it's better to use it and hopefully help people in the future? Yeah. Because no? I like to be blissfully unaware of everything and I feel like if they can sort of justify why they're using it I wouldn't mind it as much as long as I know it's going to be respectfully treated, sort of. Apart from that, I'm pretty chill. I don't, I don't mind, like, it can't really go back in my body, can it? So if they want to use it for research, I'll just throw it away. And is there any research that you wouldn't want that to be used for? Um, I think if it was for, like, a commercial, like, not a pro, like a um, <laughs> if you think about it who's doing the commercial research it's drug companies yeah. drug companies make their money by selling drugs people will only buy drugs not illicit drugs if they work so the commercial research funds the development in medicine which yeah, is why also cosmetic companies use uh, that's medicine. different yeah um, so what you're basically saying is not where it's for something you don't really approve of like makeup well, I'd just like to know if it, if it was a like a business that is using it rather than like yeah, the yeah. government yeah. funded but for it, not all most drug companies what happens is the government funds the early stages of research yeah. and then the drug company well, I'm, I'm will take it over it's just I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong but it's, it's you can tell I've had this conversation many times yeah. before because that's what everybody says not um, for commercial research but other, if we don't have commercial research, we don't have new drugs, which means we don't have treatments. I'm not saying I'd say no, I'm just saying that's the situation where I'd like to be asked consent so that I know that, what company is taking yeah. it, because like obviously companies have different like political roles yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Does everyone feel the same, that they should be asked, even if it was as little as blood's left over from a test? You, you have to think, perhaps if you have a family member who's been very ill, perhaps and died, that if some research had been done, that might have saved their life. It's the not knowing, it's the not being asked that really upsets people. So, um, various groups discussed this question. Should consent be so important? Who, do we have a spokesman from a group who talked about it, who's prepared to tell me? <laughs> Go for it. Um, yes, I think it should be even more important than it already is. Why? Because <laughs> anything that comes from the body is like it's just as bad as someone coming into your home and stealing the stuff from your like your home, but probably more so because it's like personal and it contains your DNA. And if anything happened to your DNA or anything like that like it has done in the past, it could cause like serious problems for you. So if I wanted to do a study looking at risk of infection from contamination from sewage in Galston, would you want me to come to your house and get your permission to look at the faeces that I've collected which may have come from you as they go down the sewer? Yeah. If you, could, if, you, if you were in the position that you could identify my faeces in a sewer, then yes, I would want you to come to my door and tell me that that is what you're like looking at. Okay. Does anybody agree with her? Does everybody agree with her? In any situation? So you, I mean, you know, I use faeces because I assume nobody keeps their faeces and treasures them forever. Um, but there was a study in London done back in the late 1980s where every pregnant woman's blood was tested for HIV. But the only information they wrote was female and her age so that they could get an understanding of the number of, pregnant, of women who were of pregnancy age and pregnant who were HIV positive. And if you seek consent for all of those, you're into a terrible nightmare because back in the 1980s, if you were HIV positive, you weren't going to get life insurance, you weren't. So they tested them without telling people because that would have caused so much trouble. So as you've probably gathered, I'm not totally convinced that absolute consent for absolutely everything matters. It depends to a certain extent on the research that you're going to do. Isn't it a 
a good place to start from, though. I think... If the default position is ask for consent. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's the way to think about it. Yes, we should seek consent unless there is a very good reason not, and we should have to get a proper overview to make sure that's correct. Are we really happy with that idea? Well, if I'm deciding I'm going to look at her faeces without her consent, who can, de is it, can I decide all by myself, because I'm a totally trustworthy person, or do you want a group of other people to decide? Yeah, I guess you should do that, and also people like, maybe higher up, so I don't know, you're, like, uh, maybe an organisation that isn't like you, I guess. So should we call them, say, a research ethics committee? Does that sound yeah. a good name? Is yeah. that what you're talking about? A group of people? Yeah. I used to chair the one in Great Yarmouth. That is exactly what happens. So a group of people like me sit in a room and discuss, can we look at the poo? You'd be surprised how often we look at poo without consent. Because nobody treasures their poo that... And seriously, I am in fact the director of our research tissue store called the biorepository and thus probably the custodian of the largest collection of deep frozen poo in the country. If ever you want any deep frozen poo, I'm your man. The reason being, <laughs> no, you may think it's silly, but we collect uh, feces from neonates, babies who've just been born, and their mother, because there's a horrendous disease of children called neonatal gastroenteritis. And because of that research, instead of taking their colon out, we give them something like Yakult. And you can imagine, having a drink of milk as opposed to having your colon out is probably quite a good thing if you're only a week old. Um, and that came out of research on faeces, looking at the bacteria that were available in faeces. And then you come to the question of whose consent counts. How old are you? 17. 17. So if I wanted to put you into a drug study, should I listen to your opinion? I want to try a new drug out on you. Yeah, I think so. Does her opinion count in that situation? No. Probably not. European law says that you have to be 18 under the age of 18. Your parents decide for you. But what if you're dead? Sorry, I've just killed you. Whose consent should I have to do research on your body? The next of kin. Who's your next of kin? Depends, really. It depends, really. I like that. Who's your next of kin? Who's your next of kin, personally? My mum. Your mum? Yeah. And so, do you think it's fair for us to go to your mum and say, terribly sorry, she's just died. Can we do some research on her body? No, not really. It's hard, isn't it? Difficult question. She's going to say no. They always do. So, um, do you carry an organ donor card? You're 17. Have you started learning to drive? Yeah. Did you tick yes on the organ donor box? I am, yeah. So you're an organ donor? Yeah. Anybody else carry an organ donor card? Okay, so. Actually, all of you with an organ donor, stand up just for fun. Oh, all of you carry an organ donor <laughs> card. I've, I've, just got, I've just got to finish it. <laughs> One, two, three. You can stand up considering you're an organ donor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Can all but three of you sit down? Look round now. Can all but three of you sit down? I'll have you three staying up. Everybody else sit down. <laughs> if there was a bomb to go off in this building now and all your organs were available for harvesting and use, those are the three you would use. Those of you who've sat down, we wouldn't get, even though you have filled in the form. You can sit down again now. So, do you care? Does it matter to you, or is it just one of those things where you feel, mm, I think that box can't be bothered? No, I think it's relevant. Because if I wanted an organ or someone who I've heard about wanted one, I'd like to think someone would donate it. Sure. How, how, strong, strong, do how strongly do you feel about it? Because I think I'd just made you sit down. Yeah, I think I'd just sit down. So how strongly do you feel about it? Because I think I've just made you sit down. Why do you think we only get 30% of them? Because it's probably not viable. I nope. These are viable organs. They were all viable organs when I killed you. Nope, it's because 70% of the time, the relatives say, oh no, she's suffered enough. She's dead. But we lose 
60 to 70 percent of all the organs that could save somebody's life and if you think that's two lungs two kidneys a heart a spleen a liver those are the kind of the big seven that we transplant and then you can get onto faces and hands and all sorts of things that we can do as well yeah, far away. Can, can I just, um, I might be seeming a bit silly, if you've signed up to be on the organ donor list and your relatives say no, surely they're going against your wishes? Not only it, that. It's not a legal requirement? I think that no. you have signed away your opinion in writing, therefore we know it is your opinion. And in the Human Tissue Act, the hierarchy of consent, I, we listen to the person themselves, their nominated representative, their parents or child, brother or sister, grandparent or grandchild, uh, brother or sister of any of the above friend of long standing so in law we can just take them so why don't we why am I not take there's no you're not you lot donated had you you all said sitting down why am I not collecting your organs those of you who stood up it's very really easier to consider the person that's alive than it is for the people who are dead you are absolutely right that's why we do it is because it is seen to be not fair to cause increased trauma to people who are dead. So you told me you cared that your organs were used. What are you can do about it now? I don't know what I can do about it. I'll probably make sure that my family are aware of my decision. That's what the organ, the they blood and trans trans yeah. transplant transfusion services say: is talk very carefully. I once got. I was once giving a talk like this and I got somebody who was so, it bothered them so much, they were a bit older than you, and I said, okay, what you could do is write in your will that if your organs are suitable for transplantation and anybody refuses, they're automatically cut out of your will. And then write to all your people who are beneficiaries under your will and tell them what you said and say, it's not, I don't want you to have my money, it's that this matters. I mean, you lot. Children are a net drain on the family resources, so you're not worth anything, I'm afraid. You just cost us a fortune. But do you see how difficult it is to sort out consent? But do you think you should be paid to donate blood? Do you think I should give you a pound or 10 pounds or 50 pounds for every unit of blood you donate? See, personally for me, I wouldn't want payment because I think you're sort of going out your way to try and improve somebody else's life. And I think if you're sort of like a morally sound person in a way, that would kind of be payment enough. But I can understand that that would probably be more of an allure, like, in, it would be more engaged for somebody who... I don't know, I don't think I know anyone who would donate blood if it meant they could get a paycheck. A paycheck. I think that would not sit right with me. Is there anybody you'd like to be paid if they were donating? Ah, there you are, you see. In the States, you get paid, not very much, about $10. And we import blood to the States because they have more than they can use and we don't get enough. So we import blood products in the States. I don't have a particular problem with it, to be honest, because you can replace blood. You know, you have your nice, well, you never got the nice cup of tea and a biscuit. They have pink wafers. Sorry? I did. You did? You got your free biscuit, pink wafer. I always used to go for the pink wafers because I like pink wafers, but yeah. So you get a cup of tea and a biscuit and nothing else, but you replace the blood in a week or two. So I kind of wouldn't have a problem paying for it because the hospital pays the blood transfusion service an absolute fortune for a unit of blood. So there's money changing hands because the blood transfusion service have to arrange the collection and the storage and, the and all of those stuff. So I don't have a problem as to whether we could sell things. Should I have a problem with selling my kidney? Don't buy my kidney, it's a good kidney. Should you be allowed to sell your whole organs? I can see that shaken head. No, why not? It's just not like I think the reason you should give your blood or your organs is not for like selfish re reasons. It should be more like a like there's, you don't need an incentive to be a good person. I don't think. Oh, <laughs> you don't need an incentive to be a good person. I, I actually agree with you, but an awful lot of people do need an incentive to be a good person. Um, I, as I say, I wouldn't have a problem with selling blood. I would have a problem with selling kidneys, because then, of course, it's, you know, I am unemployed, my kids are hungry, I need a new pair of shoes, shall I they need new shoes, shall I sell my kidney for them? And it becomes a horrible route out of poverty. And, of course, there are thousands of novels written about crime related to the sale of human organs. They're all rubbish, you can't sell them. 
and you have, we have very careful control of the use of organs. But as I say, I wouldn't be concerned about blood. like the 90% of wasted blood for research, would that, would you ever ask for consent for that? I'm gonna call on Roxy to talk. Roxy actually works for me and we are building exactly that. So we will ask people, can we use leftover tissue for research? Do you wanna say anything else, Roxy? Yeah, it's just like you say, it's surplus tissue anyway, and rather than throwing it in the bin, if it could be used for research, and that's why we're developing a system so we can gain consent from everybody to keep all the surplus and hopefully improve all the yeah. research from it, really. But yeah, and definitely a good idea, I'd say. Yeah. And that brings us back <laughs> full circle to where we started with the Elder Hay and the Bristol Hearts. Most of the parents in Bristol said, no, we'd have said yes, we'd have given our consent, if only you'd asked and our system will allow us to ask. Um, and 85, 90% of people will say, yeah, that's fine. They have restrictions, uh, so we're going to guarantee we won't use it for animal research and we won't use it for cloning research, but other than that, we will use it for whatever we want. Um, and we will get back, if we suddenly discover that they've got something horrible, we will get back to them through their GP and say, you need to go and get this looked at now, or yesterday would be better. Anybody got any more questions? Okay, shall we call it a day? Wrap that up. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. We are really grateful. Uh, it was very interesting to find out uh, all about, especially like the law changing, because I did take the law myself, but I wasn't aware that the law had changed between. I knew about the old Hay case from studying, but. It was nice to see the perspective of someone who actually worked in the profession, like the profession, and who are actually really concerned what happened to like something like that. To hear what, for example, the professors had to say about it, I think it gave them an awful lot to think about. Definitely gave them some new and challenging ideas. I thought it was really good. I thought it was really engaging. It really like sparked an interest in something I'd never really come across before. So I think like you don't really consider the sort of behind the scenes of what goes on if you go to hospital and stuff so that was it was really interesting made me think about something you'd not encountered before which I liked about it. <laughs>